3 and verse 24. Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues. Notice what he did now. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Verse 24. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. The Message Bible reads this way. From there, he went all over Galilee. He used synagogues for meeting places and taught people the truth of God. God's kingdom was his theme. Everybody say, that was his theme. That beginning right now, listen now, that beginning right now, they were under God's government. A good government. And so, Eugene Peterson here in the Message Bible properly defines what a kingdom is. A kingdom is a government. Now, it includes all other terms such as domain and reign and all these other terms, but primarily a kingdom is a government. So he said that beginning right now, they were under God's government, and then he said a good government. He also healed people of their diseases and of the bad effects of their bad lives. I like that that he healed them of the bad effects of their bad lives. Verse 24. Word got around the entire Roman province of Syria. People brought anybody with an ailment, whether mental, emotional, or physical. Jesus healed them one and all. More and more people came, the momentum gathering. And then... In Matthew 9, 35, we see something very similar. This is from the message. Then Jesus made a circuit of all towns and villages. He taught in their meeting places, primarily again, the synagogues. Now notice what he did. He reported kingdom news. Have you noticed of late, there's probably more news which I don't watch very much of it, but there's more news right now about government than maybe at any other time in modern history. The news is mostly about secular government and governments. But notice, Jesus taught in their meeting places. He reported news, but he didn't report the local government news. He reported kingdom news and then healed their diseased bodies, healed their bruised and hurt lives. We'll come back to that sometime later in these teachings I will be sharing this month. And then we see from Dr. Luke, who wrote not only the book of Luke, but he also wrote the book of Acts in chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. He writes, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. So he gives an account of everything that he did and taught until the day in which he was taken up, which if you'll read into the rest of the chapter, that took place. After he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering, by many infallible proofs. So once Jesus resurrected, he stayed on the earth for 40 days. He briefly went into heaven to present the offering of his blood to the Father and came right back down to the earth and presented himself infallibly with infallible proofs for 40 days. Being seen by them during 40 days. Now look what he says. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So, of anything for those 40 days Jesus could have been talking about, he could have been talking about specifically 
healing. He could have been talking about authority. He could have been talking about the soon coming kingdom coming to the world one day. He could have been talking about prosperity, love, faith, joy. But instead, the Bible says for those 40 days, his primary message was the message about the kingdom of God. There was significance to this message. That he took time, there was so much significance to this message about his kingdom that he took the predominant time of these 40 days before he went back to heaven to talk about God's kingdom. God's government. He spoke about government news. And in Matthew 6.33, Jesus said to you and me, but seek first the kingdom of God. We'll come back sometime later on as well, and we will minister from the book of Matthew chapter 6, but maybe we'll give you some more significance about your needs being met. I'll come back later on and probably talk about that. But notice what Jesus said. Jesus said, our highest priority as a child of God, our highest priority as a child of God, he said, is for you and me to be seeking this kingdom. To be seeking the news about this kingdom. And then the Apostle Paul said to us in Colossians 1 and verse 13, He has delivered us, this is He the Father, has delivered us from the power of darkness. We could also insert the word kingdom there. That God has delivered us from the power or the kingdom of darkness and the new King James says, and conveyed us. The old King James says, translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. So notice, Paul places an emphasis on when we are converted from death to life, from darkness to light. He says to us here that we are conveyed or translated from one kingdom to another kingdom. And the kingdom that we are conveyed into or translated into is the kingdom, God said, uh, of the love of His dear Son. And Jesus Himself said to us in Luke's Gospel, chapter 17, verses 20 and 21, now when He was asked, when Jesus was asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God would come, He answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Don't be looking for something physically. Don't be looking for something that gives you solace and comfort with what you can see with your physical eyes. He said, no, nor will they say, see here or see there. He says, for indeed, the kingdom... The government of God is within you. This kingdom, Jesus is saying, is going to be within you. This government, this new type of government that people are not used to. It's not going to be out here in the ethereal world. Jesus said it's going to be right in the middle of you. Now, look what Jesus said to us. Let me begin to unveil some of this. Jesus said to us in Matthew 12, 25, Jesus knew their thoughts. And he said to them, every kingdom, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself, will not stand. You see, family, as we've already alluded to from Colossians 1.13, Jesus and Satan both have kingdoms. 
And both of these kingdoms are opposed one to another. But Jesus is teaching here, there is only one kingdom that can divide us. Only one. There's only one kingdom that can divide the unbelieving world, and there's only one kingdom that can divide the believing world. It's the kingdom of darkness. It's the kingdom of Satan. Again, Satan has a kingdom. He has a domain, a rule, a government. And this kingdom influences and places pressure on people to live in division. To live oppositely God's will for people's lives. And then Jesus, see, Jesus reveals everything to us in the Bible that you and I will ever need to know. This side of heaven. Everything that we will ever need to know, He has given us the information for it. And so Jesus, in these next verses, begins to reveal Satan as a deceiver. He begins to reveal Satan's deception in these next verses. I'm going to read to you. John 8, verse 30. As Jesus spoke these words, many people believed in him. How did people believe? By hearing words that the Son of God spoke. The Son of God's love. The King of this kingdom. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide or live, tabernacle, in my word. I just told you a moment ago, everything we need to live successfully, every bit of information we need to understand and live in this new way of thinking, in this new government called the kingdom of God, Jesus is saying to us, if these words, these kingdom government words will abide in you, he said, then you'll be my disciples indeed. And then he said, when that takes place, you will know the truth. That word know there is a word that is an intermingling of two personalities. It's an experiential knowing. That I know someone experientially. I know someone because I spend time with someone. And I have intimate time. I have intimate fellowship with someone that is near and dear to my life. That's the kind of know that Jesus is talking about. He said, you shall begin to intermingle, intercourse, experience this truth. And this truth that you intercourse with and intermingle with and experience in your life, that truth will make you free. That truth is what's going to make you a free person. Free in your spirit. Free in your thinking, your intellect, your emotions, your will. Your physical part of your life. Then, he, then they answered him. These are the religious scholars and leaders of the day. The, the people that plotted time after time after time to do what they ultimately did, which, which was kill Jesus. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants. Listen. And have never been in bondage to anyone. See, Jesus just got through saying that if you will live in his word... If you will live in His Word, He said, you'll be my students, my disciples, my, my followers. And by following me, following the truth, He's saying here, that truth that you come to experience in your life, that's what's going to make you free. But no they, no, they said, no, no. We've never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say we 
will be made free. See, religious people, and many unbelievers as well, but especially religious people, but some unbelievers as well, they, they believe that they are free apart from the shed blood of Jesus. Religious people believe they're not in bondage. Religious people believe they have all the answers in their rules and their regulations. They believe they're accepted by God based on their rule keeping. See, these Jews thought they were free because they were born a Jew. Yes, that was God's chosen nation. Yes, that was the nation God chose to make a covenant with. And yet, these Pharisees, these religious scholars and leaders of the synagogue, they were in bondage, and here's the problem. Here's the sad fact. They were in bondage according to Jesus' words, and they didn't even know it. See, Satan, the devil, the head of his regime, the head of his government, has deceived so many people today Believer or unbeliever and believer alike who are living in darkness and they don't even know they're living in bondage. There are a lot of believers today living in bondage. They don't even know it. Don't even know it. Like I've heard one man say, if you can live without God, most people will. If people can live without the truth, most people will. And so, in this same chapter, down in verse 44, Jesus begins to reveal Satan's hidden schemes for people's lives. Jesus said, he called Satan out here. He said, you are of your father, religious scholars and leaders of the synagogue and Pharisees. You're of your father, the devil. Wow. Boy, I'd hate to be on the end of that. Hmm. He says, and the desires of your father, Satan, you want to do. The desires, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. These are all the desires of your father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. I remind you, the apostle John said to us, if you hate your brother, you have murder in your heart. That you're no different from someone who takes a gun and blows someone's brains out. He, Satan, was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. There's no truth in him. There's not one iota of truth in him. Jesus said, when he, Satan speaks a lie he speaks from his own resources for he's a liar and he's the father of it so you've heard me say before that jesus calls us sheep and jesus is called the chief shepherd and we if you know anything about shepherds and sheep shepherds do not drive sheep there is a characteristic about sheep. They will not be driven. They have to be led. But cattle are not led. They're driven. Satan is a driver. Jesus leads. And what Satan does, he drives people. Or let me say it to you this way. Satan puts pressure on people to cooperate with his evil government. Unbeliever and believer alike. He puts pressure on Christian people to cooperate with his system, which is evil. And they are, in many cases totally unaware 
that they are being pressured to cooperate with his system of evil. They're not, they're, they're so emotionalized in their lives. They're, they're so adept at living by the flesh and living by emotions, they just think that's the normal way of life, to be angry, especially when they don't get their way, to gossip behind the leader's back about the leader to the people in the group. They think that's normal. They think that's the normal way of life. But what they don't understand is they're in bondage because they are cooperating with the government of the devil, the kingdom of darkness. You see, family, God wants us to know and understand what the enemy is saying into people's lives today. Once we're saved, once we invite Jesus into our hearts, into our lives, God wants us to separate ourselves from the kingdom of darkness and all of its ways. He wants us separated. You've heard me talk about holiness which is the same word sanctify or sanctification. The moment we're born again, you can read Ephesians 4, 22, 23, and 24. The moment we're born again, we are made holy. We're made righteous, and holiness comes through that righteousness with God. But where are you holy? The same place you are righteous in your born-again spirit. But there is what I refer to, and the Bible will back me up on this, there is what I refer to as an, an experiential holiness or sanctification to where we understand that God wants us separated from this system of evil, system of lies, system of deceptions, System of anger. System of hatred. System of squabbling and fighting. And demanding our way. And when we don't get our way, we manipulate by having a bad mood around everybody. God wants us to understand Satan's ways. Because he has a government, and his government is a system of lies, of deception. God wants to expose and break these strongholds that have held us in bondage for many, many years to this world system that we're living in today. God wants us to take dominion. God wants us to become witnesses of His government. He wants us to become witnesses of this new kingdom that we are now not only a part of, but is also living within us. Jesus said, or the Bible says to us, it's the Word of God, Jesus, but it's the Word of God, in talking about John the Baptist. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Then he goes on to say to the people, Repent, for the kingdom of, of heaven is at hand. And in, in effect, in essence, what John the Baptist was preaching about, he was preaching about these two kingdoms. He was preaching to these people... By the way, common, ordinary, everyday people, just like you and me. He was preaching to them to turn from their sin. To turn from their old ways of thinking, their old ways of doing things, and begin to seek God and His ways of doing things. To turn to God and to begin to change how they think, how they thought. And you know what? 
the evidence that these common, ordinary, everyday people received John's ministry and his message was that they begin to confess their sins and to be water baptized by John the Baptist. That was the evidence that they received his ministry. That was the evidence that they received what he was preaching about these two different kingdoms. They were willing to turn from doing things on their own to learning how to depend on God. To transfer allegiances. To transfer loyalties. To transfer a way of thinking. To transfer a new way of living from the old way of living. They were turning from the system of this world to the system of the kingdom of God. Family, listen to me. Today, you and I have to turn from this world system in order to live in the reality of God's kingdom. And we'll talk later on about some of this. But when we understand this government system, when we understand this kingdom that we're now in and is in us, there are benefits not only for us, but benefits for others through us. In John 18, 36, Jesus answered and said, My kingdom, my kingdom is not of this world. You see, church, Jesus, the Bible very clearly announces, is a king. In fact, the Bible says he is the king of kings, Lord of lords. I'm not talking about natural kings like the king of Monaco. John the Revelator was told by the angel of the Lord in Revelation 1, 5, and 6 that you and I are a kingdom of priests. We're kings. We're priests. I don't need to go to a, a man in a box and confess my sins to to get absolution. If I step on anyone's toes, I, it's just the way life is. I'm not trying to offend anybody. But there's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He's the mediator. He's the king. He's the one I repent to. He's the one I confess my righteousness unto. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus is the king of this kingdom we're talking about. And Jesus, again, gave us all the information we'll ever need. Jesus explained to us the way into God's kingdom is to be born into it. You have to be born into into this kingdom. We read earlier in Colossians 1.13 that we are translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. And Jesus said to us in John 3.3, 3, except you are born again. And if you look in the margin of your King James Bible, a few other Bibles may have it, but King James always has it. That term born again literally means to be born again from on high. What, what's he talking about? You have to be born from heaven. You have to be born again. It is not an earthly birth. It's not a natural birth. It is a spiritual birth. It's a supernatural birth. It's a birth that comes right from heaven. He said, unless you're born again, born from on high, you will never enter God's kingdom. So we're born from above. We're born from Another government, the kingdom of God. And in John 20, verse 21, Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And we all know 2 Corinthians 5, 17, where Paul wrote and said to us, if anyone be in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 
That's verse 17. And you drop down three verses to verse 20. And Paul begins to explain now, we as new creations in Christ are ambassadors for Christ. What is an ambassador? An ambassador is a citizen from another government who goes and lives in another nation of another government to influence this government where he's living from the country where he's from. The Bible says to his church in Philippians chapter 3 that you and I are now citizens of heaven. Not when you die, go to heaven. You're a citizen of heaven at this very moment. Ephesians 2, 6 says, we have been raised up to be seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're in Christ. We're at the right hand of the Father in Christ. We are a citizen of heaven. And as a citizen of heaven, Jesus said to us in John 17, even though we're still living in this world, we're no longer of this world. When you understand that you're a child of God and that there is a new kingdom living within you, a new government living within you, you understand that you have exchanged governments. You have now exchanged kingdoms. You are no longer a citizen of the kingdoms of this world. But you're a citizen of a new kingdom. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And I find it fascinating that Paul doesn't give us a bunch of teaching after verse 17 talking about the new birth and give us all these high platitudes and all this encouragement and all this cheerleading and, and this rah-rah stuff. He goes right into the fact, once you're born again, you're now part of a new kingdom and you're now an ambassador. You're now an ambassador. You're now an ambassador for Christ. And then that same writer, the Apostle Paul, said to us, in Colossians 3, 17, he said, whatever you do in word or deed, listen to what he said, whatever you do in word or deed, he said, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. He is the king of this kingdom. We're his kings under his kingship in this government. And Jesus said, use his name. Take advantage of of this name. The Bible teaches us there is no other name under heaven among men whereby men can be saved. The Bible says again in Philippians beginning or in chapter 2, there's coming a day that every knee of every being in heaven, on earth, and even in hell, even Satan, will bow their knee and confess that of a truth, Jesus is is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is Lord. He is king of this kingdom. He's king of this government. And by his spirit, he's come and taken up residence within our born-again spirit to lead us in this new government, to teach us a whole new system so that we can begin to do things differently by thinking differently. Look what Jesus said to us now. In using this name, he said, use this name now. In John 14, 12, and verse 16, first of all, verse 12, Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, he said, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And then he said in verse 16, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. You see, in John 16, verse 7, he told his disciples, it is expedient. That word means more profitable. 
that I go away. Because if I go not away, God cannot send the helper, the comforter. In other words, Jesus is saying, look, I'm a man. I'm God. I'm all God. I'm all man. But I'm limited in my earth suit, my body, and that I can only be at one place at one time. I can't be all over the earth in my physical state. And so he says, I can do great works, and I've been doing great works. But he said greater works. He's alluding to the fact that there will be many kingdom-minded people, new creations in Christ, who will be converted from darkness to life, from darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son, and the Holy Spirit will come, this other helper, this comforter, parakletos, this helper, he will come and take up residence in these new creations, born again, spirits of men in physical bodies, so that he will help you, he will abide with you forever, he will never leave you nor forsake you, and what he's going to do, he is going to do greater works by living in and through every believer rather than just the one person of Jesus on the earth. Greater works, many more work, because there's many more people. We're called to do greater works, not any greater than actually what Jesus did, but the greater there is the number, numerical, so many more of us. And everything you see Jesus doing, we know that we are told to imitate the Father, imitate God, to emulate Him. And so he's saying here, we have this kingdom now within us. We now have this government on the inside of us. And Jesus is saying that through us, the Holy Spirit will start causing His kingdom to come to the earth as it is in heaven. There will come a day where all the kingdoms of this world will be dissipated from the world system, from the earth, from the world. There will come a day, there will be no more kingdoms of the world, no more governments of the world. There will be one government set up. But in the meantime, Jesus said to us, pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. And they told you, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so, no, we will never have the full expression of God's kingdom on the earth until Jesus comes back. But we're to be in our own world, causing His kingdom to start manifesting. To start manifesting. I close with this story. I've told you several times, there's a friend that we have that his name is Jerry Savelle. Some of you know who he is. Some of you don't. He's been to our church several times, lives in Fort Worth, Texas. He worked for Kenneth Copeland for many years, went off into his own ministry. And back in the early 70s, he came to Odessa as the uh, advanced man for Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth was holding a meeting at the Coliseum. And they were staying at the old Lincoln Hotel downtown. And so he'd been working all day. He went up to his room one evening. He went out on the balcony, and God gave him a vision. And he saw a map of the United States, a darkened map. He saw the outline of the nation and the states. And he saw all these lights popping up in different places on the map. And one of those lights he saw starting to blink was where he was standing, right here in the Permian Basin. And so he asked the Lord for the interpretation. Anytime God gives you a vision or a dream, if you need to go ask somebody what it is, it didn't come from God. It didn't come from God. God will give you the interpretation if he's given you a dream or a vision. He'll give it to you. If not, it didn't come from him. You'll know it. And God said, son... There's coming a day in this nation that I'm going to pour out revival, 
unprecedented revival. And the places where you see this faint blinking light around the nation, these are going to be some of the hot spots that I've chosen sovereignly to begin to bring about revival. And the Permian Basin is one of these places. Listen to me. But God needs some kingdom-minded people. God needs some people that will lay aside the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, pride of life, and will make their life a priority of seeking first God's kingdom. That's the priority. For 40 days in Jesus' resurrected body, that's what he spoke about. The kingdom. The kingdom. That's what God wants us to have the understanding of, to understand we are citizens of this kingdom, that we are ambassadors of this kingdom, that God has called us in that same chapter, 2 Corinthians 5, ministers of reconciliation. That's you. It's a privilege. It's an honor. It's a joy. And please, for the sake of Christ in your life, quit going around saying living the life of a Christian is hard. It's hard when you go back and forth between the flesh and the Spirit. Living in the Spirit is not difficult. Paul said to us in Galatians 5, when you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you receive it today, would you give God praise? Amen. The Apostle Paul said to us in Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 1, watch what God does, and then you do it.